I do wish these stories would not be written as if the Big Bang is fact. Face it, there are millions of us who do not believe these theories. And our belief that God created this entire world by simply speaking, in six literal days, should be respected if not believed. I do not believe that science will ever back up the Big Bang. Sharon of Oldham, England. This video is about trying to bridge the gap between how a human mind imagines something like the universe and its origins, and how the universe really is. When most people think of a Big Bang, they think of a Big Bang like this one, followed by everything flowing from it, and galaxies hurtling out from a hot point out to an endless void. A true void, where there's no matter or anything at all. But I'm afraid this image is quite wrong. Nor was there a 1, 2, a 1, 2, 3, 4 beforehand. You've probably heard that the universe is still accelerating, that everything flies out from everything else. You may have heard of a redshift or far-flung galaxies and probably struggled with the idea of the furthest object ever being a gamma ray burst 13.4 billion light years away. But why is the observable universe a colossal 93 billion light years in diameter? I should also imagine that you've heard of the Hubble telescope's deep field image and wondered in which direction they pointed it. Why not point it back to the Big Bang? Back to the hot singularity that started it all. Some of these misconceptions regarding the size, shape and expansion of the universe come from inadequate and misleading reporting because it's just so hard to visualise what's going on without creating misconceptions. If you're wondering where the centre of the universe is, then the answer is that the universe does not have a centre as such. If you want to know where the Big Bang happened, it happened right here, where we are. Also, where everybody else is too. A good place to start so we can unravel all these misconceptions is to explain how we know how old the universe is. A simplistic explanation is that we calculate the age of the universe by calculating the speed that all our neighbours are hurtling away from us. We then track that speed back and 13.75 billion years ago we were all on top of each other and very compressed. Remembering of course that because things move away faster the further away they are because of expanding space-time which we'll come back to later then things are accelerating away from each other not just travelling at a nice steady speed relative to each other. We know the distance of other objects through the measurement of parallax or simple geometry. This is called stereoscopic conformation and the following maths is not too difficult as it's often taught to 12 year olds in some countries. In this picture the distant object O is observed from the Earth at two opposite ends of its orbit. When the angle between the centre of the Sun and the object is the same, exactly six months apart, then the distance to the object is the cosine of the angle divided by the distance to the Sun. Once certain objects true distances are verified stereoscopically then by observing very similar sized and coloured objects at varying confirmed distances we can compare their new apparent size and apparent colour to what they look like when close by. We notice the further they are away and correspondingly how fast they are moving the redder they get. This red shifting is something we have to come back to later on. We could of course argue that the universe was made before everything was on top of each other which would mean a slightly younger universe, but that would create more problems than it solves and it's extremely unlikely. There are very few arguments, especially from religious groups, that the universe is older than it is, which I always find curious. However, the furthest object ever observed that is confirmed stereoscopically is a light travel distance of 13.1 billion light years away. Note that this is not its proper distance right now. The only thing observed that is further away is the cosmic microwave background, which we'll also have to come back to later. This distance almost exactly coincides with the age of the universe at 13.75 billion years. In short, 
we can be very sure of these calculations of both the distances things are, their speed, and the age of the universe, because everything agrees very precisely. If everything can be tracked back to the point where we're all on top of each other, then it must all be going back to a centre, right? Well, no, there is no centre, or at least no centre that we can see or calculate. The reason is, we appear to be at the centre ourselves. In this small section of space shown here, the central red ball represents a volume of expanding space-time centred around the Earth. But if we were a planet in the green volume to the left, in, say, our neighbouring galaxy Andromeda, the centre would appear to be there too. Wherever you are on the galaxy, you appear to be in the centre because everything is moving directly away from everything else. That's a lot of expansion. This much used model of a balloon shows you how everything can expand relative to everything else. This first model is with planets separated by expanding squares. The second animation shows permanently sized markers to show the expansion is even everywhere. Of course, it wasn't ever going to be this easy, was it? The surface of the balloon is flat and real space has an extra height dimension. Also, the centre here is the centre of the balloon. There is no centre and the centre of the balloon does not exist in real space. It mostly just curves back on itself like the surface of the balloon does in any direction you travel, including the missing height dimension. This is because of Hubble's law and Hubble's constant. Hubble's law proves that the three-dimensional balloon is not right because if there were a center we'd be able to observe it. Here is a simple flat model to explain. If there were a center then this area here towards the center of this universe would show a clumping together of galaxies. This is because expansion is not as great at the center. Now given that the universe is only 13.4 billion years old then this center cannot be more than 13.4 billion light years light travel distance away. Therefore light from this center would appear as a cluttered red shifted spot analogous to the white cluster we see at the center of our galaxies. We don't see one, so there's very likely no center. One final piece of evidence is that the cosmic microwave background, which is like a map of heat from the Big Bang, shows that the heat is pretty much even everywhere we look. It's evenly spaced throughout the universe with no hot center to be seen anywhere. The mind-bending thing about this is that whatever direction you travel, you would eventually come back on yourself, given enough time, a galaxy to the right would actually be the other side of a galaxy seen to the left. Let's take another look at redshifted light and why it redshifts. Take two objects close together, say, a thousand light years apart. A thousand years later, due to the expansion of space-time, the light has had an uphill battle to get to its target. As far as the emitter is concerned, the light is travelling at sea the velocity of light. Therefore, from the receiver's point of view, the velocity of light is still c, but the wave has to go further because the medium is expanding. Therefore, it becomes stretched. Another way of looking at this is similar to the classical Doppler effect. In this example, the wave hits the target slower because you can subtract the velocity of the emitter. However, with sound, the frequency of the emitter is not affected, it's just an illusion. With redshift Doppler, the actual frequency of light is changed because of the relativistic speed that the wave is traveling through space-time. The mathematical way to understand it is that velocity of light, or any wave, is equal to the frequency times its wavelength, lambda. The velocity is always a constant called c. Since we are moving away from the emitter, the peaks of the wavelength hit us less often or with less frequency. Something has to give. If the frequency is less, yet the speed of the light remains a constant c, then wavelength has to give, and it does. The most distant object you can theoretically see is where its light began its journey about 500 million years after the Big Bang. 
Yet the cosmic microwave background goes much further back. It's an emission of photons or light that's been scattered after the first time that light could escape the dense plasma that was the early universe. This is a picture you'll have seen before, but it's often quite badly explained. However, we can tell an awful lot from this picture. You've probably confusingly heard that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across. However, this sphere that you see projected onto a flat picture represents light from galaxies that were nearby 13.25 billion years ago. So how can it be 93 billion years away now if light only goes one light year per year? The short answer is that the microwave's light travel distance is only 13.24 billion light years, but because of expansion of space time, the emitter of this radiation is now 93 billion light years proper distance away. The first possible misconception we must address regards light travel distance. Just as an example, let's use a non mathematical explanation first with no consideration of relativity and uniformly expanding spacetime. So let's take an object we observe to be a thousand light years light travel distance away. Because of expanding spacetime, we know that the proper distance is somewhat further away, here. However, one thousand years back, you may think that the object was one thousand light years away when it started its journey. It wasn't though. It's not merely two objects drifting apart, the very fabric of space-time itself is stretching. A better analogy would be to consider that the two starting points were joined by an elastic band which is stretching and accelerating faster and faster. At this point, for further reading, I recommend you look for Ant on a Rubber Rope in Wikipedia to show you just how counterintuitive and paradoxical velocities can be. The main difference, however, is that our rubber rope is not stretching uniformly, it's accelerating. Let's take object UDFJ 39546284 we mentioned earlier. How far away was UDF when light first started its journey from UDF out to us? For ease of calculation, we're not going to consider any relativistic effects. We know the light travel distance is 13.14 billion light years away. We know its redshift is 8.55 and its proper distance is approximately 30 million light years away. We can know the proper distance by rescaling something called the luminosity distance, which is an object's absolute magnitude of brightness compared to its apparent magnitude of brightness. Standard mathematics gives us this equation. This takes into account all the co-moving distances of coordinates in an expanding system. This is the mathematics that works behind the scenes in digital modeling programs and CGI animations to make things grow and contract. So what's the proper or co-moving distance of UDF now? It's the luminosity, dl, equal to 1 plus z times dm, where z is the redshift. So with the known quantity dl equals 86.9 billion parsecs and z equal to 8.55, this gives dm 8.69 over 9.55 equal to 9.1 billion parsecs or 29.68 billion light years. Given the same equation slightly rearranged to work out how far away our UDF was when light first started travelling to us we calculate the following. The scale factor at is equal to 1 over 1 plus z where a is the proper distance back when the light began its journey. So the scale factor for UDFJ39546284 is 0 0.10471. So given the present distance is 30 million light years, then 29.8 by 10 to the 6 times 0 0.10471 equals 4.37 by 10 to the 6 light years away when it started its journey, 13.14 billion light years ago. In other words, it was once only 4.3 billion light years away, but it took 13.14 to get here due to the expansion. Finally, how far away was the cosmic microwave background when it started its journey towards us? The answer using the same mathematics is... The redshift of photon decoupling, which is the moment the radiation was released, is z equals 
1090.89, which implies that the scale factor at the time of photon decoupling would be 1 over 1091.89. So if the matter that originally emitted the oldest CMBR photons has a present distance of 46 billion light years, then at the time of decoupling when the photons were originally emitted, the distance would have been only about 42 million light years away. This means that even though the release of these photons was at 380 million years after the Big Bang, UDF was fully formed only 220 million years after that. Not only that, expansion was such that light from 42 million light years away, 380 million years after the Big Bang, has only just reached us. Yet light from 3.14 billion light years away, 280 million years later, has only just started to reach us now. That means there must have been a huge rate of expansion initially, which then flattened out for a period. Looking back at this diagram, that's exactly what we see. The path of light coming to us did not even start in the right direction initially. But what of this singularity? How big was the universe when it started? The answer to that is that the universe never tracks back to a singularity unless there was infinite time. But we know it's pretty small, and in any sense of the word, it was also everywhere. So it was never a tiny, infinitely small point, which is what we should really be defining a singularity as. So in conclusion, we can safely say that even though the term Big Bang and Singularity are misnomers, they work as simplistic terms to describe the history of the universe as we know it so far. And it's not even particularly complicated maths or observations that proves it. Do you really still think that the heavens were created on the sixth day, 6,000 years ago, by God simply speaking. If so, to quote Richard Dawkins, you're a disgrace to the human species.